This is the story of Harry Nyquist. Born in Sweden in 1889, Nyquist spent much of his career at Bell Laboratories in the United States. The work he carried out at Bell Labs in the 1920s laid the foundation for what we know today as digital communication. In this video, we will look at his 1928 paper, one of the most important and remarkable pieces of analysis in the history of communication theory. It is an example of where engineering and mathematics collide to produce the most useful of insights. When Nyquist began his work, our understanding of communication theory was primitive, but when he died in 1976, the seeds of his work were about to bear fruit in ways that he could barely have imagined. Nyquist was a pioneer of the digital age. His insights, though often misunderstood and confused, were an important and necessary step towards the modern digital revolution. It is 1820. A Danish physicist called Hans Christian Ørsted discovers that an electric current deflects a magnetic needle. Further experimentation reveals that the same electric current can be propagated over long distances and deflect a second needle at a distant location. This was the birth of the electric telegraph and, in many ways, this was the birth of digital communication itself. And this emerging technology would pique the interest of a new generation of inventors and venture capitalists. In just three decades, the system of Samuel Morse became the de facto standard, a simple system of on-off pulses. Between 1840 and 1920, a vast global network of telegraph lines and cables had been built, creating the first global communication network. It is difficult to understate the importance of electrical telegraphy in the development of digital communication theory. But when Nyquist began his illustrious career in 1917, very little was actually known about the fundamental theory underpinning the transmission of digital information. And this was becoming a problem. Nobody understood why some communication channels performed so poorly, why there was so much distortion when the telegrapher increased their speed. It was almost as if there was a limit to how fast a signal could be sent. In 1928, Nyquist would publish a paper which would, more than any other, shed light on why there was such a capacity on how fast a digital signal could be sent. The key which unlocked this answer was found not in the minds of the American and British venture capitalists, rather it was from the brilliance of a French mathematician. In the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries, a series of great mathematicians had discovered the duality between time and frequency. But it would be French mathematician Joseph Fourier who made the key insight. Fourier discovered that any periodic time domain signal can be represented as the sum of pure sinusoidal waves of integer frequencies, from DC to one cycle, two cycles and so on. Every periodic time domain signal can be represented this way. Each has its own particular combination of frequencies and weights, its own recipe. Even a series of telegraph pulses can be represented this way. Nyquist asked the right question at the right time. And then he answered this question using the powerful language of Fourier series. What happens if you strip the signal of some of its frequency components? What damage would this do to the signal? Will it strip away the information content? Nyquist's answer would send shockwaves through the 1920s and lay the foundation for our modern understanding of digital communication. There are really only two fundamental questions in digital communication. The first is how much information can you send per signaling event or per symbol? The second, is how fast can you send these symbols? In 1948, Claude Shannon 
would unify these two ideas with mathematical precision in what would become known as the mathematical theory of communication. But two decades prior, Nyquist would lay an important foundation, and the key was the channel. The channel is the physical medium between transmitter and receiver, but it has a limitation. It is frequency dependent, and to be more precise, it is almost always exhibiting a low pass characteristic, which means it allows lower frequencies to pass, but attenuates higher frequencies. And so Nyquist knew that the channel would be stripping away frequency components. It was robbing the signal of its Fourier series coefficients, vital parts of its recipe. In his paper, Nyquist considered a series of 10 pulses, representative of a typical telegraph signal. In the frequency domain, its bandwidth would be fairly high to capture the full resolution of the pulses. But Nyquist wondered what happens to this signal when it's at the mercy of the channel, that is, when its high frequency components are stripped away. But the key question Nyquist asked was how much of this recipe or how many of those frequency components are required to preserve or to retain the information content of the signal? To answer this question, Nyquist did something that nobody had done before. A signal, of course, is continuous. The information is contained in the position of the signal during a particular interval, a burst of energy that spreads over time. But Nyquist did something different. He considered the signaling event to be at a discrete point in time, at the mid instance of the pulse. As long as the signal is correct at these particular points, the information is preserved and distortion-free communication is possible. But by doing this, we create a new form of duality between time and frequency, rather than equating a continuous time domain waveform with a finite number of frequency components as we do with Fourier series, we can now equate a discrete series of points with its frequency components. And Nyquist found the exact relationship between these two things. This was Nyquist's famous signaling theorem. It states that to signal at a rate of 2b, a bandwidth of no less than b cycles per second is required. In other words, the bandwidth b of the channel places a capacity on the signaling rate. This is the most remarkable of Nyquist's insights. We stated previously that there are two questions in digital communication. First, how much information can you send per symbol? And second, how fast can you send the symbols? It is important to note that Nyquist shows here only how fast you can send the symbols, not how much you can send per symbol. So it's possible to send multiple positions per symbol. The bandwidth requirement is actually unchanged. 20 years later, Shannon would take Nyquist's channel capacity and expand it to account for the first question too, giving a general capacity on information transfer through a band-limited channel in the presence of noise. It's a theory which is as relevant today as it was in the time of Nyquist and the golden age of electrical telegraphy. But ultimately, it was Nyquist who showed that the channel itself imposes a capacity. And it was Nyquist who, for the first time, set up a duality between points or samples and their frequency domain components. Nyquist today is most associated with the sampling theorem, which in many ways is the opposite way to see the duality he set up in his paper. But Nyquist never explicitly mentioned anything about digital sampling or digital reconstruction in his 1928 paper. It was something 
that was quite accidental and a testament to how far-reaching and unique his initial analysis would be.